We are in Philippians chapter 2, which is one, you're not allowed to have a favorite part of the Bible. You've got to kind of believe the whole Bible. But if you were allowed to have a favorite part of the Bible, this would be my absolute favorite uh, portion of Scripture. So powerful and so ancient. This is a portion of Scripture that is from the very, very beginning of Christianity, which is an amazing idea we'll get into a little bit later in the sermon. But I, I want to start off by asking you what you feel about the violin. Do you like the violin? How many people are fans of the violin? You see, my, uh, I, I love the violin. I love the cello as well, too. Just really love them. But here's my premise. Here's my theory about the violin. There are two levels of violin playing. Level number one is, oh, my goodness. And level number two is, ouch, that hurts. Does anyone agree with me? <laughs> this, for instance, is Ixok Perlman. He is the number one violin player in the world. Just, just, just listen to this for a second. Just take this in. You feel that? It's every single note just right to the soul. This is an 11-year-old learning the violin for the first time. Listen to this. Do you feel the Holy Spirit leaving the room right now? Do you feel that? The truth of the matter is, the sobering news for you and I this morning is, in the area of unity, we are all more like that 11-year-old than we are Ixoc Proman. And here's the real sobering news. What does it sound like when you and I try to play together? It kind of sounds like this junior high band. Wait for it. Here it comes. Oh, oh. Did, you, what, did you hear it? One kid pulled a hamstring while he was doing that. Huh? Can you and I agree that we all need to work on living, playing, and being in harmony with one another? We're talking about born for unity. I'm going to put this verse on the screen. This is what the Apostle Paul says in verse 2 of this epic chapter. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded. How do you get to like-mindedness? I want to tell you, it's counterintuitive, really walking in unity, going into this Thanksgiving and not having that fight that you have a tradition of having that fight with your Uncle Bud who brings a Bud, not having that fight. It's not going to work the way you think it's going to work. You see, there are some things we think are related to unity and they have no impact on unity whatsoever. The context of our passage really teaches us this. There are three things that Paul's not going to say to us about the area of really playing in harmony with each other. The first thing that is not about unity at all is conformity. In other words, to be unified has nothing to do with looking the same and acting the same and talking the same. That sort of plastic Christianity where we all have to dress the same and talk the same and look the same is not found in the Bible. In fact, I don't have to look like you is exactly what happens in the city of Philippi. Paul goes in there, he starts a church. First person converted is a wealthy business person. Then the next person is a demonized teenager. And the third person is a blue-collar jailer. Very different backgrounds. And yet together, they came together to be a powerful church. It's not conformity, and it's not proximity either. You don't have to be close physically to someone to be in unity with them. You don't have to spend tons amount of time with someone to be in unity with them. Paul is writing from a Roman, or maybe Ephesians, probably Roman prison. Paul is farther from the church of Philippia, in Philippians than any other church in the New Testament, and yet this is the church he gets along the best with. He's more in tune with these guys than anyone else, even though he's not close to them physically. And the last one is unanimity, which means we don't have to agree on every issue. In fact, get this in your head, in your family, in your church, in your workplace, you'll never agree. If you're in total agreement, you're in a cult. That's what a cult is. <laughs> and even in cults, there's secret, secret disagreement, but they don't want to say it. The, 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 the humans don't work this way. We'll never have the same ideas because we've got the image of God in us and we're creative and we're thinking and we're problem solving. The way to unity is not to get identity and identicalness 
in our thinking. Paul, uh, uh, Ray says it this way. It's just genius. He says, we don't have to see eye to eye on everything. We have to walk hand in hand. There's a big difference. Even in this particular passage, Paul is dealing directly with a fear he has about some force in the church that will disunify them. But it's interesting that he doesn't even bring up the issue. We don't know what the issue is. He doesn't try to solve the issue. He doesn't speak to the issue. He speaks to their heart. See, the Apostle Paul understands that you and I cannot create unity. You cannot manufacture harmony. Stop trying. Harmony is not something to be made. It's something to be found. It's a, it's a paradigm shift that if you can make this paradigm shift, especially going into this holiday and, and in our culture right now, wouldn't you agree that our culture has lost all semblance of civility and unity right now? I mean, I used to look at my Instagram every day and I'd see little, you know, kitten pictures that would come up. So cute and soothing. Now I see sexual scandals in my Instagram. Every, I'm waiting for one of these candidates to have the moral courage to dig up some clean on the other one. Oh, that was funnier than the reaction I got. <laughs> see what I did there? Dig up some clean instead of, okay, we're moving on. The point is this. You need to discover where unity's at, not manufacture it. So my friend CJ, he did this for us last week. I thought it was so pr profound. It illustrates this point exactly. These are two for tuning forks, right? And they're tuned to two different keys. I think this one's the key of C. And if you have perfect pitch, I'm probably wrong. I think this is the key of A. Two different ones, right? I strike one. It vibrates in that way. I strike this one. It vibrates together. Yeah, they don't sound good. Now, here's the really cool thing. If you take this off and you unify the keys that they're in, they're both in the key of C now, I don't have to strike both of them to get both of them to work in unity. Just tuning one will cause both of them to sing. Watch this. Do you hear that? Works in the opposite too. In other words, when they're in the same key, when they're in accord, one source can make them both sing. If you're smart, you've guessed what that one source is. Unity cannot be manufactured. It has to be found in Christ. Who Christ is, that's a very important phrase, not just what he's done, but who Christ is, is where the Apostle Paul leads the church of Philippi to find unity. Who he is and then what he did. Both of those things are the chord that struck in the heart of the human that brings us to unity, living out unity in a deeply divided world. What is it about Jesus that we need to tune our lives to? How can we switch our paradigm and quit trying to manufacture unity between each other and actually get tuned to Jesus? Lincoln says this in the small group study this week. And by the way, if you haven't gotten a, in a circle up, go get in one. Lincoln has this powerful illustration, and I'm not going to reveal it to you. You've got to watch it. But he says this interesting phrase. He says, unity is a sound. What is that sound and how do we find it? Number one, write it in. Tune to the gratitude found in Christ. This is an incredibly important starting point. It's not what will get you across the line, but it's where you must start. How many here have ever watched the show The Office? You watch The Office? Uh, I was in a really weird office once, so I have a hard time watching that show. It reminds me of a real boss I had at one time. But I remember once I was watching it and Dwight and... Uh, Michael are in the car and the GPS is on. It's the first time Michael has heard a GPS and it's telling him, turn right, turn left. And he's like fascinated by it. And it tells him to turn right. And they start having this fight because Dwight's like, no, it means to veer right. And no, Michael says, no, it means to turn right. And they start fighting and he turns right and drives right into a lake. Does anyone remember this scene? He drives into the lake. And at the time, I laughed and laughed and I thought that would never happen. Guess what? Google it. Thousands of people following their GPS drive into rivers, streams, and lakes every single year. There's probably someone in here going, oh, no, it's me. He's preaching about me. I'll give you a couple examples of this. There's a U.K. woman in Electeshire, I think I'm saying that right, in the U.K. in 2007 who drove into this river. Uh, a couple of women were going to a conference in uh, Bellevue, Washington. They were driving a Mercedes SUV, and in the middle of the night, the GPS told them to drive into this slough, and they lost the SUV. Japanese tourists in Australia wanted to visit the ocean. They drove into the bay. 
In Bradford County, PA, a man drove his truck into the river in May 2014, and that was the third time that year the GPS had led someone to actually drive into the river. A Canadian woman drove her car off a pier in Lake Ontario just this last year, May 4th, 2016, into freezing cold waters. Now, here's the things that all of these incidents have in common. It's dark or foggy. It's a complicated road. And here's the, here's the important one. Because of lack of cell service, in each one of these cases, the GPS started off at the wrong point. If you start off at the wrong point, you end up in danger. The very right starting point of unity is not debate. The right starting point of unity is not even dialogue. The right starting point of unity has nothing to do with what you do. The right starting point of unity is to recognize, make an appeal to, change your attitude about, memorize, understand, and focus on what Christ has already done for you. Paul, genius, inspired by the Holy Spirit, in verse 1, look at it, he says, Therefore, therefore, I want you to focus on these things. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any sharing in his spirit, if any tenderness, look at all the words he's pouring on there, encouragement, comfort, love, sharing, tenderness, compassion. He's saying take a moral inventory, take stock of all your blessings, take a break for one minute from everything that's wrong and rehearse what's right. Here's the key, you have to concentrate on his provision. You'll never be unified with the people around you Here's what happens. This is easy to explain. The second you start focusing, concentrating on God's provision, here's what happens to you. You become a less grumpy version of you. And no one wants to be in harmony with grumpy you. Turn to your neighbor and say, I just need you to smile more in this life. I need you to. Turn to your neighbor and say, on a rainy day, he makes us turn to the neighbor a lot just to get energy in the realm. So get used to it. It's a lot of turning to the neighbor. It's kind of a core exercise when Pastor Kurt <laughs> preaches. Just turning this neighbor, turning to that neighbor. Let's, let's review these really quick. Here's, this week, just sit down with a piece of paper and make note. Love, that's basically commitment. How has Christ been committed to you? And then take a step further and say, how have the people around me been committed to me? If you made a list of every way that Christ has loved you and the people around you have loved you, what would happen to your gratitude level? Number two, sharing. That's how it's supplied. What has God given you? And by the way, do you have someone else in your life that's, that's shared with you, that's given you things? What about listing where tenderness and compassion is? This is care and understanding. Or another way to say these two words together, it's just God's grace. Where has he given you grace where he should have given you justice? Where has he given you care an understanding where he should have given you judgment. And has anyone else in your life given you care and understanding? Has anyone else showed you? What would happen if we started Thanksgiving early? What would happen to Uncle Bud who drinks a Bud? If instead of trying to get him to change who he's supporting in the election or talk different about that obnoxious subject he always brings up, what if we found just one thing to be grateful for about him? What might happen to our unity? The starting point is gratitude. Uh, I might give you a checkup for each one of these points. I want you to apply this. So, so a sign of unity is increased thankfulness versus increased fault finding. Which one of those is on the rise in your life? Are you more and more able to spot what's wrong with things? Or are you more and more able to spot what's right with God and all he's doing? It's not bad to be a person who can figure out what's wrong with things. Never let that be your starting point. It's so crucial that your starting point is encouragement. By the way, if you become a person that starts from gratitude and encouragement, when you do find out what's wrong with things, people will listen to you. But if you start with fault finding, well, your chance of being unified goes way down. I, I want to talk to the Circle Up leaders for a second. Where's my host at? You guys are doing a phenomenal job. Did you guys have as good a group as I had this week? Man, if you're still getting into the group, hosts, don't give up. Still cultivate those relationships. Keep putting out snacks. Snacks is from the Holy Spirit. That's what will make that group bond. 
If you're, if you're only at one person's house, talk about maybe, you know, switching around houses if you want to do that. My circle of group this week was phenomenal. And what happened was we watched the teaching and then afterwards we asked a couple questions. And like two questions in, one of the people just really opened up with something very vulnerable about their life. And I know you're not supposed to kind of gradually get into this, but we just had a mascara meltdown in our living room. I just, we prayed for each other. Now, here's what I want to encourage you. I, I hope you'll get to that place. But I want to say this, it's not always about talking about what's wrong in your small group. Host, do me a favor, lead this really well. Talk about what's going right in your life, what's right about your kids, what's right about your spouse, what's right about your church, what's right about our world. Get, cultivate that gratitude and make sure that it's not all just prayer requests and problems. Amen? Amen. Are you guys still with me on this? Okay, we got to move forward because ver point three is the one I want to get to. Write point two in real quick though for me. Tuned to the humility embodied by Christ. I, 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 I can't tell you how many times I've studied this passage and it just still strikes me the overall mindset and attitude of Christ. You know, often there's something inside of us. We want to be noticed. We want to be understood. What is it a person says in a bad fight? You don't, you don't understand me. We want our voice to be heard. A friend of mine was invited to be a part of a mass choir when he was in high school. He's got an incredible voice, and it was part of an elite thing in the entire state of Washington. 400 students, the best of the best from every high school, got together, and they invited this celebrity choir director to come in and direct this mass choir. He said on the first day of the first rehearsal, they were going through the complicated piece of music that they were going to learn, and the director, the choir director, stops them halfway through the song, and he goes, hey, you in the back, yeah, in the red shirt, you're, what's your name? He says, I'm Rick. He says, you won the state champion solo contest last year, didn't you? This guy's chest just puffed. He goes, like the famous director knows me. He says, yes, sir, I did. I won that contest. He said, Rick, I got information for you. Your vibrato is so loud I could drive a semi-truck through it. Oh, my goodness. They can hear you in Arkansas. This is not a solo contest. It's a choir. You need to lower your voice, take your vibrato out, and blend. Friends, sometimes we live our whole life eager for a solo moment. When Jesus came to earth, lowered his authority, lowered his power, lowered his person, and blended in with humans. Verse 2, make my joy complete by having the same inner motivation as Jesus, by being like-minded with him. Have that same love that he showed for us. Being one in spirit and mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Underline those two hidden motives of disunity. In humility, value others above yourself. Whose voice should you make sure everyone hears? Look, look at verse 4. Uh, if you're married... Verse 4 should be your theme. I guarantee you, if both of you in marriage do verse 4, your marriage will get better. If you've got a great marriage, it will get even greater. If you've got a marriage in crisis, if you'll both submit to verse 4, your marriage will get better. I guarantee it. It won't happen overnight. If you practice it, it will work. If you work it, it will work. Look at verse 4. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. That mind shift going, my main worry is you and what you need. If both of you do that, Mutual submission, it will get better. What's the key? Eliminate ambition and conceit. We, we start with gratitude, and that leads us to this place of maturity where we go, i got to get rid of every bit of selfishness and every bit of conceit in my life. Let's put some definitions to these two phrases. What's selfish ambition? It's success at the cost of relationship. Have you ever met that person who's very successful in this area, this area, this area, and this area, and yet no one really likes them? You know, the worst and saddest place you can be in, sir, is in a place where you're so successful that no one likes you, but they all lie to you. Where in the room, they laugh at your every joke, but the second you leave, they begin to plot against you. I can't tell you how many people that I have met that are in that exact situation and don't know it. And the reason they're in that situation is because of vain conceit. What is vain conceit? It's an obsession with self 
inspired by insecurity. It's when we self-promote and we combine that with self-importance. When we think too high of ourselves and we're wondering why everyone else doesn't notice how good we are and what we do for this business and what we do for this family. You know, if you're that sort of person that has to drop hints about how awesome you are, you're not. <laughs> and you're hurting every single relationship in your life. You know where that comes out of. It comes out of insecurity and ego. Here's the checkup. A sign of unity is that there is a decreasing level of conflict in my life. Pa uh, Pastor Ray says this in the study in the small groups this week. And it, please don't miss that. It's just a genius thought. Here's the reason. See, when you're blind to what the, what the source of disunity is in your life, you'll never be able to get unified. I can't tell you how many people I meet and go, man, that's so horrible, Kurt. I'm in this horrible season where everyone at work is in drama and everyone at home is in drama and everyone at church is in drama. And I'm like, what's the common denominator of those three environments, my friend? <laughs> Maybe you're not tuned to the humility of Christ. What are the needs of the people around you? What would happen if you took a time to be more concerned about them than you? What if you asked them what their interests are? And you became an advocate for those interests. Which brings me to point three. You know, I, I probably read the Bible through, I don't know how many dozens of times. And there's very few passages where I can remember the very first time I read it. Th this is one of them. Verse five, literally this is one of them. I was 16 years old. I'd been saved only for a few months. And uh, I was going to a small Student gathering. It wasn't really a Bible study. They called it a Bible study, but we would go. Some guy would provide free donuts. We'd sing one song, and then someone would share one Bible verse, and we would pray. And after going for about three months, I mean, I didn't know the difference between the Old and New Testament, friends. I knew nothing about nothing. I thought it was the book of Job. I, I realized, like, hey, there's this guy in the Old Testament. There's a lot of bad things happening. He's a cool guy named Job. And they all laughed at me. And I'm like, J-O-B, it's the book of Job. And one day, the leader said, Kurt, tomorrow morning, I want you to bring the Bible verse. So I went home and I, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just did this. I just went, when you have entered the land as the Lord. No, that won't work. Uh -huh. The fish gate. No, that's not weird. That's, and I, the third time, it just turned to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I'll tell you, friends, even right now, third time I preached it this week, this, even right now, I'm, I'm in that moment. You see, this part of the passage that we're about to study, it's a song. Paul introduces a song, and it's a song I'm sure that he sang with the Philippians. I'm sure he's referring back to a moment of great unity and harmony and worship and the presence and the power of God. You ever been in service, and service is good, and then there's a God moment? You ever been just in that place where all of a sudden, you know God's there, but you can feel that he's there. This is the moment that he's referring to. Tim Keller says that in the mountain range of Scripture, this is one of the highest peaks. You're not allowed to have favorite parts of the Bible, but I want to tell you, the sense and presence and the identity and work of Christ are so accurately described in this song that Paul's about to refer to. The impact of this, it touches every single part of our life. Look at verse 5. He says, this, in your relationships with one another. Stop right there. When you encounter Christ, when you get the real Jesus, it changes relationships. Amen. You know, uh, John Stott said this. He said, no one ever had a moderate reaction to Jesus. He said, if you look at scripture, all, every person that encountered the real Jesus did one of three things. They either hated him for his claim of of being God, or they feared him for the questions he asked, or they completely and entirely surrendered every relationship to him. Some of us, we want to read the Bible and come to church and, and say, I like that Jesus, I like that Jesus. Listen, if you just like Jesus, you haven't met the real one. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ. In other words, as you consider who and what Christ did, it has to tune every relationship in your life. And then he begins the most beautiful song, the most incredible piece of theology. Now, what you have to get in your head before we read this song is this. They sang to worship just like you and I did. From the earliest parts of Christianity, we have pictures where people lifted their hands. They did exactly what we did. They sang to worship. But more than that, they sang to teach. 
You see, people were not as literate then, so reading and writing was not the way they got doctrine and truth into people's lives. Part of what they did is memorize verses like this as a way to get in doctrine. This is a picture of the earliest doctrine of the primitive church. Here's what's important about this. The book of Philippians is written within 20 years of the life and death of Jesus Christ itself. This song predates that. This is the earliest doctrine of the earliest form of the church. This is what's so powerful. We're going to learn that what they believe about Jesus is what we believe about Jesus. That for 2,000 years, it hasn't altered, it hasn't watered down, it hasn't changed. Who Jesus is and what he does is as assured today as it was then. And what is it? What is it? Look at verse 6. Don't clap yet. The good part's not here yet. Look at this, verse 6. I mean, look at this. Who, being in very nature God. The first line, who, being in very nature God. This Greek phrase, very nature, it's actually the word morphe. And the word morphe is often translated form. But that's not a good translation because form in the English connotation is the outer. We have the form of this or the form of that. That's our outer in our thinking. The Greek word for that same concept, outer, is schema. This is not schema. This is morphe, which means the inner essence in other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying by quoting this song is Jesus is exactly the inner essence of God himself. Jesus Christ is not like God. He's not in the form of God. He's not on the surface God. He's not a God. He's not a bit of the divine. Jesus Christ from the very beginning is God himself. Never let anyone tell you Jesus is less than God Almighty because he is. Now think about this. The least likely people to believe that God would actually become a man were Jews. The least likely, they revered God so much, it was impossible for their mind to get around this at first. But Jesus' life was so powerful and his death so true that this small band of Jewish people said, who being in very nature God. A thousand sermons could be preached on that one phrase alone, but that's not where it stops. It goes to another level of humility. It says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Again, a phenomenal translation in the NIV. A lot of versions would use the word grasp. That's literally the Greek word here. And it doesn't mean grasp at. It means holding onto, clenching onto. It's like a child when you try to take a treasure troy away and they say, mine. He said he didn't say the authority of God, the position of God, my place in heaven is something I will hold on to and never let go. What this is saying is it wasn't to his advantage, but God himself Freely let go of all of his position and all of his authority. Why did he do it? Verse 6, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at or to hold on to or to not give up to his own advantage. Rather, verse 7, he made himself Nothing in the Greek here is so powerful and poetic. The word nothing means to pour out. It's the idea of taking precious oil or thirsty water and pouring it all out. Every drop goes upon the ground and is absorbed in the earth. Not a single bit of him remained in heaven. All of who Christ was came to us completely, entirely committed by taking the very nature of a servant. Not only did he come to us, he didn't come as a king, he didn't come as a business person, he didn't come as a political figure, he didn't come as an artist. He came as a carpenter. Now think about this. The word carpenter in the Greek is actually builder. Jesus, the creator of everything, came as a builder of wood. It's so interesting. It's, it's almost poetic and prophetic at the same time. Jesus was a builder his father was a builder. He came not just to be a man, but a particular type of man, a servant. Being made in human likeness, verse 7 ends. And then look at verse 8. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. And it doesn't stop there. You see, the death that he received was a particular type of death. It was a death reserved for only slaves and the worst of all criminals. A Roman citizen, 
even in the worst of all situations, would have had their head removed, which is how the apostle Paul died. But Jesus, the creator, the builder of everything, came and died, even a death on a cross. He had no citizenship among the very creation he made. He was completely disowned. He died a slave. Now, friends, if you've ever been to church, if you've been to an Easter service, you've probably heard about the physical torment of the cross. The cross is a genius instrument of torture because the Greeks started it as as a way to intimidate the armies they were fighting against. They would take the wounded on the battlefield and they would tie them to a tree so that they would die slowly. Then the Romans got a hold of this concept and said, we can make it better. What the Romans realized is that if you put piercings in someone's feet and wrists, To breathe, they had to push on those nails and pull on those nails to open the diaphragm. This stopped the body from doing something. You see, the body, when it's under extreme torture, will pass out as a way to save the mind from that pain. The only thing is the body cannot pass out if it cannot breathe. And so the state of torture of the cross is to continually keep you on that verge of almost passing out. And yet your body has a little more adrenaline so that you'll push on those nails and pull on those nails to open the diaphragm one last time. And this way, it's a genius torture device. And this is why the guards came and broke the leg of the criminals next to Jesus so that they would die faster in suffocation. But what we may not realize, even if you've heard that before, was the genius of the psychological torture of the cross. In World War II, those that were captured by the Japanese and tortured often said that the physical torture and the starvation were not the worst part. Being a honor culture, the Japanese understood shame better than we understood shame. And they used it in the most evil sort of way in this particular dark season of torturing people to what one soldier said, they were genius at making you less than human. This is the shame of the cross. This is the primary motive of this tool. That's why they beat you and mocked you first. That's why they made you carry your crossbar up a hill to the highest plate. That's why they stripped you naked. Every crucifix you see, Jesus has a loincloth on. But when he laid before the sin of man, he was naked. Some of us with great grief have encountered teenagers that have been shamed online. And so, some of us might think, well, that's not a big deal, a little teasing. It makes perfect sense to me that some of these teenagers that have been shamed online would even think about ending their own life because deep in the heart of the human soul, shame is one of the most powerful pains we can experience. And by the way, if anyone's ever bullied you or teased you or shamed you, you need to know this, Jesus understands shame. He was a God who did not grasp onto his authority but let it go, pouring himself out to become a man and not just any ordinary man but a servant and not just any ordinary servant, friends, but a servant all the way to death and not just any ordinary death but the shame of the cross. One commentator has said that it was the most painful and the most shameful way to die. Think of this. The builder of the universe was put to death by the very trees he invented. He was pierced by the very iron that he forged, and he was laid in a tomb that his own hands had hewn. He was shamed by his creation. There's only one response when we encounter this Christ. There's only one response. And that is to imitate the submissiveness of Christ in every relationship. In your relationships, Paul says. What is your submission level? What is your understanding of what has been paid for you that then therefore motivates you to lay your life down for others? A sign of unity is that we actively lower our position and we seek who we can elevate. If God lowered himself, who then should we seek to promote? There is no unity apart from understanding what Jesus has done for you and I. But when we get that, there is no relationship he cannot impact. Which brings us to our final point. How many here have ever had a teacher that spoke in monotone the entire time? Have you? 
Have you endured this? Every great communicator, every great musician, every great playwright, every great actor understands that there needs to be a dynamic in our presentation. I had a chemistry professor who was 1,342 years old, and he taught in a class <laughs> without air conditioning in the spring semester, and he droned on and on. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's just a great place to take a nap. <laughs> Paul does the exact opposite here in the end. He quotes this hymn in a magnificent crescendo, and the point he's making, fill it in, is simply this. To be in tune to Christ, we have to tune to worship inspired by Christ. Have you ever wondered why we come into this room and sing songs? I see all of you come into this room and you do different things. Some of you are just so eager for worship. Some of you walk in and it's so weird. You're like, people are flashing their armpits everywhere. What is this? <laughs> and I want to tell you, whether your experience is that you're super eager or this is a new thing to you, I want to encourage you, be the sort of person who learns how to step in and step closer to worship. Worship is the most powerful culture setter. Worship is the most powerful teacher. Worship is the most powerful tuning agent. When you don't just sing the words, but you open your heart and life to consider what Christ has done over and over again, there's a repositioning of your heart and life that can happen, and it can't happen just in teaching, and it can't happen just in small groups. There's a place where everything starts to align in your life when you learn how to not just lift your hands, but lift your life to him. Bow your knees and acknowledge who he is. Get your mind around what he's done for you. As we worship, we tune ourselves to Christ and therefore become tuned to each other. You, you and I have an obligation in our day-to-day -day life. We have a survival technique in our day-to-day -day life. We have an absolute discipline we must master in our day-to-day -day life to be people that walk in worship more than songs, more than singing, extolling his name. And bowing our knee. He begins his crescendo in verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. The word highest there is from the Greek word where we get the word hyper. It's not just high. It's the highest of the high. And he gave him the name, which means authority that is above every authority. That at the authority of Jesus, every knee should bow. Because he did not grasp at heaven. Because he poured himself out on earth. Because he became a man. But not an ordinary man. A servant. And not an ordinary servant. A servant willing to pay the price of death and not an ordinary death because he paid the price of crucifixion because of that he has all authority Amen. and every knee should say thank you thank you I worship you I praise you every tongue acknowledge in other words with your body and with the vocal thoughts of your spirit you should acknowledge the authority that Jesus has won. And look at this last phrase, please, verse 11. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That word Lord right there is kurios, which means the Lord of Lord. That word right there is the word that was used for Caesar. This is a protest song. This, this is a dangerous document. This was illegal in the first century. They're asking in this hymn the most important question then that could be asked and ever should be asked. By singing this song, they're simply saying this, who is the Lord of our lives? Is it this culture? Is it this world? Is it Caesar? Or for all that Jesus Christ has done, do we tune our lives? Do we set a course? Do we reposition everything we are? to his lordship? Do we bow his knee? Do we exalt him? And it's the same question that I have for you today. Who really is the Lord of your life? Some of you have been going to church all your life. You need to retune right now and truly make Jesus your Lord. Some of you have never made that decision and this is your moment to go because of what he has done for me, I'm gonna make him the true authority in my life. I'm gonna worship him. I'm going to follow him as Lord. The last key is simply this. Elevate the name, the authority of Jesus to both builder and ruler of your life. And by the way, I think this message is so important. This passage so crucial. It would be a shame to just talk about it and not do it. So I'm going to ask every single person to stand to their feet right now. I'm going to ask us to elevate Jesus. No one leaving, no one moving. Every heart, one mind, one body. Stretch your elbows. I'm going to ask you like you've never done before to give God this minute of pure and complete worship. Let's tune our lives to Him. Amen?
your eyes right now. Just close your eyes. Just you and him. You and Jesus. You and God right now. I'm going to invite you to do what Christians have done for 2,000 years. Just turn your hands upward to heaven and open your heart to God. Just give us, just give Jesus a minute right now. Just in that posture. Father God, I pray that every single life in this room would be tuned completely and totally to you. Me first, God. Build in me a life of gratitude. Not where I'm constantly figuring out what's wrong, but where I'm constantly meditating on all that you've given and done for me. God, help me with humility. Help me have the same mindset that you had. Help me promote others. Help me be a champion of other voices. And most of all, Lord, let me know again and again, all you gave up, all you did, and who you are. You are God, and yet you're one of us. You are a powerful king that served. You took my shame. Let that resonate in me. Let that tune me, God. Finally, God, I pray for all of us. Make us a church that worships you as Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I would be amiss if I didn't ask this question one more time. Is Jesus Christ truly the Lord of your life? Can you sing with a clear conscience that he is the Kyrios, the Lord of Lord of everything you do? If not, I'm going to invite you to enter into the best relationship any human can be in, a relationship directly with your maker, the God who came to earth and died for your pride, your guilt, your sin, your lust, your greed, every fault and failure in your life. He took the punishment for it so that you and he could have a relationship for all eternity. Is that you today? Are you ready to take that step of faith and truly make him the Lord? If it is, just pray this simple prayer. Right where you're at, I'll pray out loud. You pray in your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus. Just, just with your heart filled with faith, say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I lay down my life before you. I'm tired of being the ruler of my own life. I give it to you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And now I ask, I give you permission to use me. Tune me to your will. Tune me to your purpose. In short, I pray, 
make me a follower of Jesus Christ. If you just prayed that prayer, you just made the most important decision any human can make. And we want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that he would launch you into an incredible journey, just the same journey I've had every day, him guiding and leading you further and further into his purposes. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to turn the house lights up just a little. If you prayed that prayer, I want to pray for you right now. So do me a favor. If you prayed that prayer, stick your hand up. Stick your hand up. Keep it up high so I can see it. Yeah, yep, yep, yes, yep, yep, yep. Keep it up just for a minute so I can see left to right, front to back. Yes, way in the back. Man, with the child, I see you. Yep. On the sides. Yeah, I see you, sir. Yep. Anyone else I didn't see? Just want to make sure. It is so awesome in this moment. Can't you sense God in this moment? Isn't he so good? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for every decision that was made. Take him on this incredible journey. Show him the height and depth and width of your love. Spirit of God, introduce yourself to them. Guide them. Instruct them, bring them into your truth. God, surround them with people that love them and encourage them to walk with you faithfully every day. Father God, tune their life to yours. And Lord, not just for those that made a first time decision, I pray for all of us in humility. Lord, more gratitude, more humility. Father God, more sacrifice and more worship in our lives. Every family, every business, every apartment, every home, and in our church especially, God, more worship for the name that is above all names. And we ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said,